much for this introduction. Uh, actually, I am, I am almost blushing after hearing all of this. And I'm also amazed to see so many of you here listening to this presentation. Wow, thank you very much for coming. I hope uh, you enjoy the presentation, so I'm trying to do my best here. And I want to show you a bit about the research that we've been doing uh, in the last um, couple of years. And in particular, I want to introduce the technique uh, of known operator learning because uh, sometimes there's uh, things that are being tackled right now in machine learning where we already know more about the problem that can be integrated. And sometimes it makes sense actually to reuse that prior knowledge. So um, I'll give a short introduction if, if possible, if not. I'll give a short introduction. I'll not remote control, but I'll press buttons instead. So the, well, in deep learning, we see quite a few things happening. And there's many, many, many things that are being tackled. And most of the things that are being tackled are perceptual problems, things that you can see. And typically, you need humans to do it. And what people are trying to solve in these uh, new deep machine learning algorithms is try to um, process data and then extract some information from that. And I want to show some example. This is based on a reinforcement learning technique. And here a colleague, so it's a collaboration with Siemens actually, uh, they tried to detect anatomical landmarks in whole body CT data sets. And the idea this, that they used is that they formulate it as a kind of game problem where you look at some patch of a volume and try to decide to go into the right direction in order to detect that anatomical landmark. Somehow motivated by how a radiologist looks at an image, you know, he looks for anatomical structures that he knows and then follows towards the landmark he's interested in. And here we try to uh, model this as a, a game approach and we use an agent that is kind of playing this game to detect the landmarks. We're using a multi-resolution scheme here, so we gradually zoom into the image in order to refine finding that landmark. And the nice idea about this whole process is that it's really quick. You don't have to process the entire volume, but you only process relevant parts towards finding that certain landmark. So this approach is very fast. We can detect uh, 200 an anatomical landmarks in approximately two seconds on a full body CT. So that's uh, pretty quick. The other thing is it's not just finding landmarks, but we also get some kind of, well, interpretation because we find the path towards that anatomical landmark and we can see that it follows anatomical structures that make sense in order to figure out where that landmark is located. A cool thing about this is if you're missing a part of the anatomy, then this agent will try to leave the volume. So there's no hip bone in this volume and the agent tries to run out of the volume at the very bottom. So this is a nice approach, and uh, you know it has a couple of advantages compared to other approaches. If you consider traditional uh, liver segmentation tasks, uh, they would segment a liver everywhere, also in a head volume. Uh, with this one, we get some additional trust. But we don't really understand how the agent makes the decisions. We have this deep network that is taking some input and is deriving some reaction from it. So it's very hard to interpret this. And um, we see that these deep learning techniques, they're not only used for these perceptual problems, but more and more they're being applied towards all kinds of problems. One particular one that I want to show here is an application where they try to complete CT reconstruction images. So what you see here is an incomplete CT scan, and uh, it's, a, it's, you could say, a partial reconstruction. The image here on the left-hand side has been reconstructed only from 120 degrees of rotation, which means it's an incomplete scan. And now what people have been investigating is whether they can make this scan complete from prior knowledge, uh, from, from learned knowledge. And what they do is they train networks, deep networks like this one here. This is a UNet. And it is a, a patch-based processing technique where you essentially do a multi-scale analysis. You have these shortcuts in here, and it allows you to get uh, abstract information, condensed information, and then piece it together in order to complete the image. Typically, this technique has been used for image segmentation. So you put in an image, and you want to produce a segmentation mask. This technique has then been adopted 
and uh, been used in order to predict the artifact-free images here. And you could say, wow, there's quite a bit of missing data. I mean, if you think of the reconstruction problem here, uh, if you look, there's no ray ever collected that would tell you where the actual boundary of the chest wall is. Uh, this information is completely missing because you never see the lateral X-ray projection. So you can see that here, that there's the smearing effects here, but you can't even locate this boundary here. And the uh, same is also true here. And I can tell you, you can train those units, and even on an unseen patient, you can get images like this one. And this is quite amazing. Yeah? It's completed, the chest wall is in the right position, and the information seemingly has been completed. It's quite an amazing result. So we've been thinking about this and said, okay, this is, it kind of looks too good, right? It, it's somehow seems to solve all of the problems that we couldn't tackle for a long time. So we just decided, okay, let's, uh, let's make it a little more harder. Let's hide something in this volume um, that the algorithm has never seen during training. And what we did is we, we've been hiding a lesion here very close to the chest wall. Yeah? So this is exactly the region where we were missing a lot of data. We haven't observed this boundary, a lot of artifact. This is a blower view. Here you can see uh, and magnification of that lesion. Now, if you look into the intermediate reconstruction of what we feed into the network, is this image here on the right-hand side. You can see this is where the lesion uh, is located. And, well, it's kind of there. And it's there because it's round. And uh, if you know the Radon theory, it's a round object, so there should be some response here. But you can also see that there is some uh, artifact very close by to it that looks very similar. And now we start this deep learning processing and try to complete the image. So let's, let's make a short uh, feedback. Uh, so who of you thinks uh, that the lesion will be there? We, we, have, we have two believers, three believers in deep learning. Everybody else, is, oh, four, four. Only four believers of deep learning? Ah. Okay, here, here's the answer. The lesion is there. It really manages to reconstruct the lesion. Amazing. Wow. Um, so, interesting that this, it really can complete the image. It uh, looks approximately correct. Lesion is there. Um, but remember, we are in the domain of learning problems. And as soon as you start leaving the domain of the training data, where you put something in there that is unexpected, you get very, um, yeah, you get not predictable results. Here, it's not the lesion uh, that would make the algorithm break down, but we trained everything in noise-free conditions. And if you think of uh, a CT acquisition, there's always a little bit of Poisson noise. So let's add a little bit low-dose realistic Poisson noise, and then the following happens. So it's not just um, that we are that we are uh, losing the lesion, but we also move the entire chest wall by approximately a centimeter. Uh, so you have to be very careful how you train your uh, algorithms in order to make them robust. And here in this problem, we suddenly get a very different image. So if I show you this back and forth, you can see uh, how much the chest wall moves. Of course, you can harden, and then you train in uh, respective noise conditions, and voila, our lesion is back. So you have to know your noise very accurately in order to create the right training simulations, and as soon as you change your noise level here, uh, it may lead really big uh, changes. By the way, so these are like the properly converged examples. Um, remember, this is a local optimization procedure, and what also may happen is that you produce results like this one, and I hope you can see that. Um, in this example, this is a, a, one of the iterations where we didn't find a, a very good uh, solution to the problem. You can see that this is the air behind the patient, and here our network started taking the noise and forming organ-like shapes into the air floating beside the patient. So these kind of things make you think, okay, um, maybe we want to understand the problem 
a little bit better and reuse things that we already know. And maybe we don't have to reinvent the wheel. I know there's publications out there and researchers out there that can show that you can learn a Fourier transform from data. And it will emerge if you converge properly in your network architecture. But if you know from the first place that there must be a Fourier transform, then uh, why not reuse it? So um, we took this opportunity to go back a bit to the, to the fundamental theory and think about how our problem actually behaves and try to investigate that a little better, what would happen if we reuse some of the information that we already know, some of the theory that we already know. So if you look at the universal approximation theorem, we can see that uh, we can essentially model um, any continuous function on a compact set. We could model on... Uh, as an approximation where you have some uh, linear combination of some input and uh, this is handled throughout uh, a non-linearity. Typically in classical theory things like the sigmoid function here are used here so it needs to be a bounded function and once you use these uh, monotonous bounded functions then you add uh, another superposition, another linear combination of those bounded functions. And this would allow you to compute an approximation here as capital U of the true function U of X. And we can show that this error is bounded by some constant uh, over the entire domain of our set. And the interesting part... Um, you, it will work for bounded functions. And in this, um, well, if you use uh, Gaussian, then you can also try to compute a basis. Yeah? So, but this is, uh, this is not a basis. And it's uh, these sigmoid functions, and they are um, motivated by the, the classical neuron theory, uh, that you need to have this activation, and at a certain activation, then the neuron will fire. And these kind of uh, functions you can find everywhere in the neural networks. So this is why they are specifically focusing uh, towards these kind of activation functions. But what uh, the universal approximation theorem tells us is that we can approximate any kind of function as a neural network with one hidden layer. And this one hidden layer uh, will also give us bounds on this error and uh, to be to be frank, or uh, to specify this a little more, this epsilon here is actually uh, dependent on the number of neurons. And the more neurons you use, the smaller you can force this epsilon to be. So that's uh, also interesting. Uh, it essentially tells us that all of this deep learning uh, we don't need. Yeah? We could just take many of those neurons, and it would also lead a very good prediction. Problem with that is uh, that the number of neurons very quickly uh, approaches a very high number. Yeah, so uh, then it would become at some point infeasible to take a number that is close to infinity. So you couldn't approximate it that well because you need this many neurons. And this is why deep learning then started stacking these layers on top in order to get more abstract and more compact representations. Still, this universal approximation theorem holds. And we can now think about these cases that we know from deep learning where we go uh, towards stacking layers on top and now we would be interested in what happens if we already know that a certain operation is on the path. Of course, in order to train it with backpropagation algorithm, you need to be able to compute uh, some kind of derivative through that operator. This is, of course, something that needs to hold. Otherwise, we can't uh, train it in the backpropagation algorithm. But uh, technically, we are able to do things like that. And you can look out there in literature. There's already many examples where these kind of configurations are being used. And they have a lot of uh, practical advantages. For example, they reduce the number of free parameters because you already know the parameters, you put this block in there, and you don't have to care about that. Now, this is a bit, um, uh, bit complex to start with, so let's start with a very simple function. And now we assume that there's some function uh, f of x. Now, x is a vector value. And uh, there's a decomposition into some function g of a function u of x, which is a vector-to-vector -vector mapping. And we know that this decomposition must exist. Now, if we look at this, we can use our, uh, um, our universal approximation theorem and think about the effect of approximating different parts of this function. Uh, 
And now what uh, I can do is, of course, I can know g and approximate u. This would give me some f of u of x. I could uh, know u and approximate g. This would give me some uh, approximation f g of x. And both of them introduce some error. So this is the error u, e u, and e g. And of course, I can approximate both of them, which will introduce some error ef. So this is if I use this entire approximation chain. Now we can analyze this a little more, and you see it's rather easy to do that because we can simply plug in the definitions. And if I want to approximate g, I can use the approximation, but I'm doing an error, and I can just add the error back. So then the error is gone. Then I know that the g is a, is a superposition of sigmoid functions, so I can use the definition again and see this is a linear combination of sigmoid functions, and here I'm using component-wise the function u uh, of x and the bias plus the error. Now, of course, I can also approximate u. So then I get the approximation here, and I get the error in here. Now, the problem that we have with this is, of course, now the error of u is inside of the nonlinearity, and we somehow want to pull it out. And we cannot, if it were linear, we could just simply take it out. It's not linear, uh, but it's bounded. So we can, instead of just analyzing how the complete function behaves, we can at least look at the bounds of this error. So now I'm uh, trying to look at the bounds and what well, if you're interested in bounds, the easiest thing that you can do is you can start working with a Lipschitz constant. And I'm just putting in here this animation because it's uh, very nice and it's freely available on Wikipedia, so I can show it to everybody. So the Lipschitz constant is the highest slope that occurs in our function. And I'm just following from the respective point with the highest slope. And if I do that in a positive direction, I'm always above the function. If I do it in a negative direction, I'm always below the function. So that's fairly easy to digest problem. And uh, it allows me to define this upper bound here. Now, I can go ahead and use this kind of approximation and do a little bit of arrangement. And I don't want to do the practice to run through the entire uh, configuration here, but I will just look at the result that you obtain if you do so. And the result is that you can find this upper bound on the arrow EF. Remember, that's the approximation of using both of the approximators. And that is given as a sum of the configura configuration of our operator G um, multiplied by the Lipschitz constant and the errors that I'm doing in the respective uh, dimensions of UJ plus the upper bound on the error that I'm doing on G. And this is nice because now I see our upper bound is additive. And note that these are all, these are all uh, positive numbers in here. Yeah, also Lipschitz constant is positive. So I have um, a, a, an additive bound of u plus the bound of g. So I see that they add. And this is nice because it tells me essentially if I know u, then all of these errors suddenly are 0. And they cancel out. And if I know g, then all of these errors are zero, and they cancel out. So meaning, hmm? um, yeah. So it's a it's a pretty coarse bound. Yeah, that's true. So I'm assuming that the errors are not too big. So I, I'm optimistic about the errors. <laughs> but you can also see uh, that it converges to zero if you know everything. Sure, which makes sense. Uh, but it's a it's a rather coarse bound. And now you can see also that this bound is interesting uh, because it is very much in line with what we know from classical machine learning pattern recognition theory, where typically u of x would take the role of a feature extractor. We are trying to find some abstract representation. And if you do some error in the feature extraction, there's no way that the classifier can bring it back. So that's a very classical interpretation. And we also understand why there has been so much research on feature engineering as we uh, machine learning people call it today, because uh, you want to have good features in order to make good predictions. And uh, just a reminder, all of this requires Lipschitz continuity. If you don't, uh, you have to find a different solution to this. You can extend this to deep networks. Uh, this is also essentially just applying the same idea than uh, in a kind of recursion. Uh, also rather straightforward to do. Uh, and we, although it's a rather simple analysis, we we're quite lucky that we couldn't convince somebody, a reviewer, um, and mm, 
make him believe that it's worth publishing. So we were lucky to have this published last year in August in Nature Machine Intelligence. So it's a quite nice result. But uh, of course, this is just a, a theoretic kind of evidence of something that you would probably immediately agree that it makes sense to reuse things. But uh, of course, it was nice to have some additional evidence uh, that we are not just doing heuristics here, but there is really uh, reason to believe that we can make better algorithms with that. So we can now apply this to our problem computed uh, tomography, the one I started with. And you can see that there's, uh, we are here in the Radon lecture hall, so it's just appropriate uh, that we show the Radon inversion here. And uh, we know already from 1917 uh, how this inversion needs to be done. It's uh, essentially a convolution and uh, a large sum. And we do the convolution back, uh, back projection and then suppress negative values because we would assume that in our clinical cases uh, the patients don't emit the radiation by themselves. So we can convert this very nicely into a matrix notation, discretize the whole thing, then we would end up with a discrete operator A and uh, we can essentially replace that with the pseudo inverse and now we see a very nice analogy that we can formulate this as a kind of filter. So we have here A, a transpose inverse that would relate uh, to this filter up here and then the back projection that is just a matrix transposed that we have to multiply here. So we get uh, this kind of solution. And now the nice thing is this is completely discrete and because it's discrete matrix mappings, they are immediately compatible with our uh, neural network design. And here we can skip over many of the nonlinearities and just replace them by linearities. And we are able to express the entire algorithm as a neural network. So this is nice, but actually there's not much to learn. Because we know all of the weights, uh, we can derive them from Radon's solution. So there's really nothing uh, that we need to train in this case. Uh, if we want to go ahead uh, to fan beam projection formulas, so this is parallel beam. For fan beam, it's slightly more complicated uh, because we have to add some additional um, weighting matrix W here, which is a pointwise multiplication. But it's not that different. It's also we can formulate it as matrix, no big deal. So let's just go ahead and put this to practice. Well, of course, a complete data acquisition, we don't have to train anything. Uh, we can just apply it, and it works. Uh, that's not surprising. But of course, we can now also look into limited data cases. And now this is, we have a 20 degree fan angle, which means that we need a rotation of 200 degrees. We didn't go to 120 degrees, but 180 degrees here. And you can already see if I'm missing 20 degrees, I already get severe artifact. So you can observe that here. And this artifact is, of course, not so great. And our radon inversion formula fails in this case. But we can take the algorithm, train it via um, backpropagation and just adjust the weights of this algorithm and then we end up with this solution and this solution looks much better so we can see there is some residual artifact if you look closely there is some streak artifacts here we are missing data of course but we get a much nicer solution to this problem now the nice thing is because it's a radon inversion uh, we can map it back into the original interpretation and here I did exactly that and the main difference that is learned is happening in the redundancy weights, this weighting matrix uh, W that you've just seen. This is where the change is taking place. You see, this is how we initialize with. These are redundancy weights that weighs uh, opposite rays that are, exactly, that are collected twice. Those are weighted down, and the rays that are only collected once that are in this area here, they are, have a constant weighting such that you get a correct reconstruction. Now, of course, uh, this is not the case anymore if we have limited uh, observations. So colleagues from Philips, they actually is, um, proposed in 2017 that you could do um, an upweighting of rays that run through an area that is collected less than once. So they found a heuristic, an idea that says, OK, let's increase the weight in this area where we have too few obs observations and increase the weight. And because we know that uh, we would actually have to double certain of those rays. They just do the opposite of what you do in these areas here and lift them up. Now, if you look what uh, this neural network uh, approach did, uh, and already in 2016, uh, it did exactly the same thing. 
but we didn't use a heuristic, uh, this is data optimum. If you look closely, you can see distinct differences, and in particular, you see that the weighting here continues to the very boundary, and here it falls down. And the explanation is rather easy because we never had objects that would fill the entire detector. And this is exactly the detector boundary, so there was no chance that our network would learn also to increase the weights there because they're never backpropagated. So this is nice because now we have some result and we somehow can also understand what our network, well, the network is actually equivalent uh, to the Radon inversion, has actually learned. So now we could say, okay, but Radon inversion is not the state-of-the-art method for inverse problems. Yeah? You want to do something more complicated. And there is very nice approaches by uh, Tom Pock and Kerstin Hamanik uh, from Guards, and we had a small collaboration with them, and essentially hooked up on the problem where we are already. So we had this intermediate reconstruction that still had some streaks. And uh, we designed an objective function a kind of, could say, a compressed sensing type of approach, where you say, well, we want uh, to have a solution uh, um, finally out of our optimization. So this is the optimization variable. And we want it to be close to the reconstruction of our neural network. So we punish this by an L2 norm. And then we have some kind of regularizer. But the, uh, the, the so this is based on shrinkage. So we have a shrinkage function here and a, a projection onto some, some basis, but we don't know the shrinkage function and this projection onto the basis. So we say, okay, these are variables that we would like to know, and this is one of the main problems that you also have in compressed sensing. You need this, reg you need this sparsifying function. You need to know what the sparse domain is, and now the idea is, well, can we learn the sparse domain of our compressed sensing type of approach? And if you look at this, you say, no, you can't, because this is an energy minimization and it's not a neural network. But um, Tom Pock and uh, colleagues had this very nice idea, well, if I can't optimize the actual uh, energy functional in this way, as I would like to do it, I can unroll the gradient. So I can do the gradient optimization, where I start with some variable and then do the optimization steps. And the nice thing with this one is, this is now a previous iteration and then some processing of the previous iteration, so one step of the objective function's gradient direction, and then add it to the previous, or go into a negative gradient direction and use this as the new iteration. So you can unroll it. And if you start unrolling it, then you suddenly end up in something that all the neural network guys really like to see because it's end-to-end. -end. So we can start with our previous um, instance, our filtered back projection type of reconstruction, and then we plug in steps of gradient descent. And all of these steps, I'm doing a limited number of steps here, so maybe only 10 steps. And uh, if you do these steps, they all have the same structure. So they do essentially transformation into the sparse domain, the shrinkage, and then the uh, going back into the original domain. Yeah? So I can find this, and because I'm postulating it needs to be a, a sparsification term, I can write all of this up. And then I have data. I know how this works. I know how uh, the artifact-free image so should look like. And then I can start learning this projection onto the sparse domain, including the shrinkage. So I can learn the shrinkage function, and I can learn uh, the respective projection onto the sparse domain. And let's see. Well, it works. You can see here the full scan reference. Now I'm using a much more narrow window that you can actually observe the artifact much better. And here you see that our neural network reconstruction still had significant artifact. And now if you um, go ahead and do the additional variational network, so the approach by Tom Pock is uh, coined variational network. If you do that on top, you can see this sparsifying transform that is learned is really able to punish streaking artifacts in the reconstruction. And it's not just denoising, as you would see here in the BM3D filter, that does not get rid of the large streak artifacts. But what um, we've been doing here was actually able to do so. This also has a very nice relation to the concept of resonance. If you're familiar with resonance, um, then 
you know that resonates always take this form that you have some input and you are actually learning some kind of side branch here that is added back to the original input to produce the output of the network. And whenever you have this kind of um, variational network structure, there's always a resonant in merging. Uh, every variational network is intrinsically a resonant because you have this gradient descent type of procedure. And you can then also say, well, uh, if I had resonates that would have the same function block here all the time, then this resonant uh, would approximate the gradient uh, of some unknown energy function that you try to optimize. Well, does this only work for CT? No, it does not only work for CT. We also have some uh, applications here, an example of a hearing aid. So a hearing aid, we also know a lot about this hearing aid. So you can see that uh, some, some speech input, there's an analysis filter bank, then it uh, does a, a directional microphone processing. Then there's the noise reduction, and this is the difficult part, yeah, that you have to know how to do the noise reduction uh, pr appropriately. Then you have the gain control, a synthesis filter bank, and if you want uh, to avoid feedback loops, you also need uh, a kind of uh, feedback loop here in order to prevent that. And this is the kind of pipeline that you would find in a, in a hearing aid uh, as it's being used today. This is, by the way, a collaboration with Simantos. Now, if you go ahead and do this, the most relevant part the, is the noise reduction. So now the question is, can we find a better noise reduction in this synthesis or signal processing pipeline? So we can do the same trick. We map the entire um, filter bank and the analysis all onto a network, and then we plug in a deep network. Well, it's not so deep. It's only three layers here, but it's, uh, it's a rather wide network. And we put it in here, and the rest is already known. So what we do is we mix uh, synthetic uh, uh, noise and speech examples together and try to predict the noise-free output. So it's a kind of autoencoder structure, you could say. So let's look at some example. And now I hope you can hear this. I hope you can hear this. Welche Gaststätten bei mir in der Nähe? Okay, speech. So now the noise. Können Sie mir sagen, welche Gaststätten bei mir in der Nähe sind? Ich wohne in der Wildestraße. Ich möchte mal etwas ganz... Okay, to be honest, hearing aids hate this. Yeah. So this is non-stationary noise is something you don't like to process. And this is now the output of the neural network. Können Sie mir sagen, welche Gaststätten bei mir in der Nähe sind? Ich wohne in der Goethe-Straße. Ich möchte mal etwas ganz Neues ausprobieren. So there's a little bit of a problem still in the solution found by the neural network, but the, the quality is quite amazing. One disadvantage by this one is um, the algorithms that we are using here right now run on a GPU system, and we can do it in real time. We can also do it without significant delay, but of course you can't have your GPU system in the hearing aid, so there's still some work to do, but the first results already look promising. Well. What else can there be done? Uh, let's look a bit into, into the outlook. Uh, I think the, the nice insight here is that most what we do in classical signal processing theory is uh, in many cases compatible with what we do in neural networks. So we can then also do things like, can we derive a neural network? Yeah. So let, this is some, some example from orthopedics. Yeah. They have x-ray projections and they do this magnification. So if you have a crack here, a crack in the bone here and a crack in the bone here will be magnified differently, and you can't measure it in the projection image, so we would need a reconstruction in order to get uh, this appropriately done. So what they would like to have is a parallel projection. Parallel projection is nice because the parallel projection has no magnification, and they have projection images, they're used to them, and they suddenly are metric, so they could measure in them. Well, it's the same object. We can measure this one, we don't get this one, but we know how to manipulate equations. So we can say, let's uh, try to get a pseudo inverse here, uh, then we plug it in, and then we are using a trick. So this is, this is kind of ugly. These are really big matrices, and I need a matrix inverse here. And maybe I can find a solution that is 
again as in the Radon inversion a convolution. So I'm just postulating. I want to see a solution that simply has a Fourier transform here, a diagonal matrix, and another Fourier transform in order to make it efficient. And then I can search for this solution and define my new neural network architecture derived directly from the imaging problem. And note, this would also work uh, for nonlinear formulas. Yeah, this case is very simple because we have all linear operators here. Uh, but as long as you can compute um, uh, derivatives, subderivatives, or subgradients, even through the operation, you will still be able to use backpropagation. Now let's look at some results. So this is uh, work by Christopher Süben, and uh, he trained only using synthetic examples, and then we are showing immediately, so this is only cylinders and noise, and we show immediately the result of the processing over the iterations on an anthropomorphic phantom here. Now you can see this converges to a very nice uh, image. We can also do it with projection-dependent filters, and again, only training on synthetic data, we get quite uh, appropriate performance on anthropomorphic human-looking-like data. And this is a rebinning now, and this is actually MR uh, rebinning. We were working on a hybrid system. But you can see that this allows us to determine uh, essentially a kind of rebinning approach that's very efficient on the, uh, on the one hand. And second, it has this convolution in there, and it produces very sharp images. Well, typically, you have interpolation involved in rebinning methods that yield very uh, smooth images. So we can intrinsically learn an appropriate filter uh, with our rebinning method that can compensate for this uh, interpolation artifacts. So I hope I could convince you that, uh, of course, many of these things that are done in neural networks are absolutely equivalent to what we've been doing for many years and vice versa, so we can uh, unite the best of both worlds. And I'm not telling you to stop doing deep learning, uh, but what I'm telling you is that it's compatible with uh, with what people have been doing all the years. And maybe we don't have to learn everything, but we can really make networks modular, make them better interpretable, and somehow get some better understanding what is happening in this black box. So uh, I hope this will then lead us to efficient and interpretable methods in the future. And of course, I'm not doing this alone. This is actually an entire network of collaborators that I'm working with. and. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for this very interesting talk. Are there any questions from the audience? We still have plenty of time. I think. No questions? I still don't stop talking. I can show a commercial break if you don't have questions. So we just... Uh, founded this organization now one and a half years ago. This is called Medical Data Donors. And because uh, of the deep learning approaches, we have the shortage of training data. And this nonprofit organization had, has the idea that we can ask patients to donate data and make it available for research and development uh, at very little cost. And uh, if the patient disagrees to have his data sh uh, shared afterwards, he can uh, always retract his consent. So the uh, consent can be withdrawn, and the consent is obtained after the examination. So how we do that is that we created those types of envelopes, and uh, we put them out already uh, in the maxillofacial clinic, where people can then ask for having their data uh, recorded on a CD or DVD. You just put it into the envelope, and then you can send it free of charge uh, to us. So you put it in here. You, you don't want to read 15 pages of informed consent, right? So you want a short summary. So we decided for something that is kind of accessible. And uh, we have the data donors. They, we had some discussion with radiologists that told us, you know, if you want to segment the heart or something in a radiology image, uh, that's actually something that any monkey can do. So we now want to uh, have monkeys to help us here. And this is why we are also asking for consent to share parts of the images, individual slices, over the internet with third parties, because this opens the way not just to mere data collection, but also to get annotations cheaply over the internet. 
And this is also key if you want to work with the data and build large, large databases, that you also have means in order to get uh, expert annotations rather cheaply. Then, of course, there's some computer scientists involved. And in the end, hopefully, we have better algorithm and better diagnosis around our patient. So if you're interested, talk to me. We are, uh, we are on Twitter with this one. We are uh, trying to get supporters in order to get this idea started. So we are mainly looking for image data. Um, yes, uh, we, we can read most formats. Uh, so if you want to donate, one thing is the data donation is only one part. When you sign off uh, with the data donation, you also agree that we can ask the clinic for the image right. Because all images, uh, of course, there's the patient consent that has to be obtained, but the image right is with the clinic. So we have to ask the clinic whether they agree uh, for it to be used. Otherwise, if the clinic doesn't agree, the data cannot be used. Yeah. And it's compliant with all uh, data protection laws. So you know, two years ago, there was this uh, new, no, I think, yeah, two years ago was the new data protection one year ago, two years ago. So we were not struck because uh, we have very good data protection officers in the clinic and our university. They knew this would come, and we are already compliant with the new EU regulations. We can collect data also in the entire European Union. Uh, we can also share with third countries as long as they uh, agree on European data protection laws. So they have to comply with European data protection, then we could also share with the rest of the world. So um, yeah, if I can convince more people to donate and to help us here, that would be really awesome, because that would make uh, our life as researchers much easier. Yes, heart, chest, uh, in any data we can get. If you want to donate, I'd be I'd be happy to support. Well, uh, I can tell you that uh, a lot of people in machine learning are struggling with the huge amounts of data that you need right now. And you can see this is really a big problem. Uh, for example, if you look at uh, state-of-the-art speech recognition system, they are often built using one million hours of recorded speech. If you transcribe one hour of speech, you need 10 hours of work. Meaning if you want to do state-of-the-art speech recognition and you want to beat uh, Google and Nuance and the big players, you need to invest, not just you need to get the data, but you need to annotate uh, uh, 10 million, uh, so you need to invest 10 million hours of work. Now, if you even do that uh, at a cheap rate, that's quite a big investment. Uh, so this is also why we started uh, Data Donors, because at some point, uh, there is a certain risk that you will only be able to do this kind of machine learning research if you have access to millions of annotated data sets. And I'm pretty sure that uh, a university researcher will not be able to pay for it. Yeah. Of course, the other solution is you find a, a smart idea not have to be able to use these millions of data sets. Because we see that every day with humans, uh, that we obviously don't need millions of annotated data. Why a human brain is so much quicker in learning? Well, if I knew how the human brain is exactly doing it, I would build it. <laughs> yeah. No, there's, there's uh, probably um, wirings that are already there, that are, are built in a way. It's also a fascinating process if you see how the, uh, how the brain matures, how it changes. And I think it's a very delicate process, but it's, uh, we see it work in so many cases. So uh, we should somehow be able to 
to learn from that. And uh, we are actually collaborating quite a bit now also with our colleagues from neuroscience because we hope that from brain development uh, and brain structure, there's maybe ideas uh, that can help us building better, uh, better systems for ourselves. Thank you.